DePaul University's Sharif Bassioni is a busy man, a preeminent international law expert. He helped create the International Criminal Court and has investigated war crimes in the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Afghanistan. The United Nations recently tapped him to examine human rights violations in Libya, and we talked with him about his findings back in June. And lately, Sharif's been spending a lot of time in the tiny Gulf state of Bahrain. On July 29th, the kingdom set up a commission to examine the government crackdown on the majority Shiite opposition following protests in February and March against the Sunni government. Sharif chairs the commission comprised of leading international law experts, and a report is due later this month. Critics of the investigation say it's too close to the Bahraini government. Sharif disagrees. We talked last week, and he told me about the scope of the report. Sorting out who arrested whom during a period of a month and a half, and we're speaking of close to 3,000 people. Where did these people go? What prison facilities did they go to? Were they tortured? How were they tortured? Were they mistreated? Was the purpose of their mistreatment designed to obtain a confession, which falls within the meaning of the torture convention, or was it intended to punish them because they were political activists or leaders? Um, how about treatment, which is is inhuman or degrading or demeaning. So when it is done, why is it done? Is it done because the people who did these arrests were insufficiently trained, were insensitive people, or was it a policy? Who is to blame? And so, in a sense, I was able to convince both the king and the cabinet. I said, you need to know how functional or dysfunctional your government is, and and particularly each ministry. So, I'm helping you do something, you know. And and so they were responsive. Well, how do you react to some of the um, things that have been written and said? You're, um, you're doing this for the king. It is a king-biased uh, operation. Um, you know, you've had uh, a lot of critical press. The opposition in Bahrain overran your offices. Well, I, I personally don't think my credibility is on the line because... I know what I've been doing, um, and yes, it is true that there was a group, actually, I, I would even call it a campaign at one time by the opposition to discredit the commission, but then things changed, and in the last few months, uh, the opposition has been not only most cooperative, but they've helped us extensively uh, by bringing us uh, witnesses, by adding additional information to us, by leading us to locations. For example, we've been investigating uh, allegations of 30 Shia mosques and prayer places having been destroyed, and and it was the, the leaders of Wafaq who took us to these places and opened the way to us and let us meet the members of the Shia community in small villages where it would have been otherwise impossible to go. So th- things in the last month have, have changed entirely. And I think by now they've come to the conviction that we're just pursuing the truth wherever it may lead us. I saw a report that, that, that you had to take appointments or something, that the people you were getting so many testimonials that um, you've had to really rein in walk-ins and all sorts of things. Well, we've received, um, believe it or not, 5,200 complaints. Uh, we have interviewed at in our offices over 2,400 persons. Now, imagine from July 20th till uh, these numbers go up to September 20th. So it's a two-month period of time to have interviewed 2,400 persons. There isn't a commission in the history of the UN or any other organization that has done so much. Um, we have cataloged uh, all of the 5,200-plus complaints we have. We have a database containing them. We consistently have teams of people. We have visited every prison. We have visited every prisoner. We have taken into account every allegation of torture. We have brought in four forensic doctors, three from the U.S. and one from Egypt, who have gone and, 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 and conducted physical examinations of people um, who have claimed to be uh, tortured or who have been mistreated and tortured in, in prison. So there's been an enormous amount of work done. Um, and, and frankly, I'm, I'm very proud of 
the work done by, by our staff. Tell us more about the members who are on the commission and why they wanted to do it. And Nigel Rodney uh, is a prominent uh, human rights attorney. He was with the UN uh, for years and was involved with uh, a torture there. Well, yes, and, and Nigel, uh, Nigel and I go back to 1975 when uh, uh, he was a young uh, activist with Amnesty International and uh, we worked together on the uh, torture convention. Um, he uh, uh, subsequently became a professor at Essex University and uh, was the rapporteur for the UN on torture for 10, ten years. Um, very well known for his uh, uh, work in, in the field of combating torture. Um, the, the other person is Philippe Kirsch, who... Uh, uh, was president of the International Criminal Court. Um, he, of course, was a judge. Uh, prior to that, he served uh, for almost 25 years as an ambassador in the Canadian Foreign Service. Um, again, very highly respected diplomat and for six years president of the ICC. The third is uh, Manush Arsanjani. She is uh, of Iranian origin. She is a career UN employee. She was the head of the codification division for uh, many years. She brings in uh, all of her experience uh, uh, with with the UN. Um, and the fifth is uh, Dr. Badria El Awadi, who is a Kuwaiti woman. She's an extraordinary woman too. She was the first woman dean of an Arab law school. She was uh, elected dean of the Faculty of Law of Kuwait in 1975. And then she became the first uh, woman cabinet officer for a minister, ministry of the environment in Kuwait and, and has spent most of her years fighting for the environment. So uh, it, it's quite a diverse group. You're listening to Worldview on WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonnell talking with Sharif Bassioni, President Emeritus of DePaul University's International Human Rights Law Institute. He's chairman of the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry, and uh, the, there's going to be a report due out in October. How do you manage to sum up what's happened in Bahrain by the time, by the end of October? A uh, Bahraini news agency report seemed to indicate that you were going to clear the government of uh, certain charges. This, is, this has been um, quite a thing. Well, it has been. Uh, first of all, the commission was established by a royal decree by the king, and this is a, um, an, a historic precedent. There's never been a situation in which, in an internal conflict, the head of state or the government decides to establish an international body to come and look into what happened and to say objectively to all sides concerned, this is what happened these are our recommendations. This is how you can move forward. Is the Bahrain royal family, in a way, clever? They've got a commission of inquiry, and they can uh, send their foreign minister to Iran, and he can say uh, to the Iranians, hey, we've got a foreign commission of inquiry, and we're going to abide by their recommendation, and uh, that's why you shouldn't be too upset. Um, they're going to use it as a political shield against um, folks who are, are going to criticize them. It, it's possible. Um, first of all, the initiative came from the king and not the royal family. Um, the king is uh, among those in the royal family who are considered reformists, uh, not conservative, um, and uh, he would like the country to move forward. And uh, whether or not he thought that having uh, a, an international commission of people who are well known for their impartiality and, and integrity uh, would help in the pursuit of democratic goals and human rights goals, um, that would be a perfectly legitimate way of doing things. Um, it would not be a way of manipulating the commission or the inquiry. It would be merely to using uh, the um, outcomes of the commission for valid reform purposes. In this kind of a pioneering operation where um, the government is an essentially contracting an independent commission, how does it work with something like money? Do you, do you have to go to the government and say, hey, you know, we need, we need X amount of money to, to do this? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. 
to to refer to it as a pioneering enterprise and and uh because there was nothing there it, it it's not like um UN commissions which I've chaired in which I'm relying on the entire UN infrastructure even though I have to wrestle, wrestle with with the bureaucracy of the UN and fight it constantly but at least it's there I don't have to worry about you know do we have a building do we have a place to meet you know do we have a staff how do i hire the staff do i have a computer do i have a telephone yeah i have to start from scratch but what i did is i uh, prepared the list of things that i wanted a guarantee of uh, and, and and i spoke to the king before he issued the decree and i said you know forgive me your majesty but this is call it a wish list because of course i couldn't say to the king this is a demand list um and i said you know i want to ensure our independence and he said well what do you want and i said i want to have free access to prisons to government uh, agencies to to files i i don't want somebody in the government to give me the file they want i want to have the right to go and say show me the room where your files on so and so are and i look in the files and i decide what i want and what i don't want and unless there's a national security issue i want to be able to take a copy of it he said you got it i said i don't want to have to depend on anybody for money i said i made a budget i'm not going to tell you what the budget is because my commissioners will be my board they will decide on how the money is being spent and we're going to have an audited account and the auditor will publish the audited account with our report on the same day i said but i want to be able to have the money at my disposal I I don't have to come to you and he said how much do you need and I said very candidly I figured the budget for 4 months for a commission like that was a million 3 and I said put the million 3 in the bank and they put it in the bank in the name of the commission uh there are two of us who have the right of signature we spend the money as we deem appropriate uh just to make sure everything is on the up and up all of our staff are paid in accordance to UN scale So if if you know Jerome you're you're an assistant secretary general that's your salary scale everybody is on the same salary scale nobody is making millions of dollars and nobody is taking advantage of it the salary scales are such and uh, you know we we pay you know whatever the market going price is for a computer or a table or a telephone we buy it at public stores i hired an independent accounting firm from the beginning i said i i'm not going to handle money you handle the bills <laughs> and i gave them uh the the authority to receive the bills and make the payments so that we don't handle any money ourselves sharif basioni is chair of the bahrain independent commission of inquiry he's also uh, president emeritus of depaul university's international human rights law institute After the break we'll talk about the recent sentencing of physicians who treated protesters in Bahrain. I'm Jerome McDonnell and you're listening to World View on WBEZ. This is World View on WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonnell and today we're talking to DePaul University Sharif Basioni. He's leading an investigation into the crackdown on the Shiite opposition in Bahrain following mass demonstrations in February and March. The commission was paid for by the Sunni-led government and it releases its report later this month. In the last 2 days, Bahraini courts have sentenced a total of 60 people to prison for their involvement in the protests. The courts last week issued harsh sentences to medical workers, including doctors who treated protesters in a Manama hospital, and their prison terms ranged from 5 to 15 years. One protester got the death penalty. Human rights groups like Physicians for Human Rights were appalled. Here's Sharif. Well, I think one has to uh, separate the wheat from the chaff. The first person who received the death penalty uh, was the driver of a car who purposely drove his car over a police officer, uh, and and when he crushed the police officer, he put it in reverse to crush him a second time. Um, and so let's. Well, quite understandable that if you have a premeditated murder like that which was on tape is on tape um uh, that is to be distinguished from the other situation uh, with respect to the doctors uh, physicians for human rights have been very quick uh, to to judge things 
Uh, their investigation at the beginning, which was done in April, was not a very thorough one. Um, and um, th- 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 there are distinctions, there are differences with these doctors. Now, let me start by saying that I'm personally very affected because a month ago uh, I worked very hard to secure their release. And uh, just before coming back to Chicago um, at the end of September, uh, they all came out to see me, to thank me for uh, having secured their release. And so it was a very emotional uh, meeting and gathering where, you know, everybody hugged me and um, and, and to see them uh, sentenced to uh, 5 to 15 years uh, was, was, was very shocking. Um, but, you know, they're, they're not all um, that, uh, that clear. Um, it, it's not that they were sentenced for setting up medical services. Some of them actively worked at seizing the hospital and, and making it a stronghold for the Shia rebellion um, and, and to the exclusion of the Sunnis. So, you know, they're not entirely angels. The fact that they um, have political motivations is, is obviously their privilege. Uh, they're entitled to their opinions whether or not uh, it was proper and ethical for doctors to seize a hospital in the pursuit of some humanitarian purposes and some political purposes is a question mark. Um, to give you an idea, um, the, the, the hospital received the people from the place called the Roundabout where the demonstrations were taking place. And yes, indeed, there were people who were injured and who came to the hospital. But if if you look at the medical records, um, you'll find the hospital was perfectly capable of handling uh, the people who came in. Uh, so it wasn't a question that the hospital administrators were incompetent and that this group of doctors had to take over uh, in order to ensure uh, the treatment of patients. So it's it's not entirely that that uh, sort of black and white. But there's no doubt in my mind that notwithstanding the differences in facts, the sentences were extraordinarily high. And what concerns me as well is the fact that these trials were before military tribunals, and and these doctors did not receive adequate due process uh, in in their arrest, in their interrogation. Many of them were mistreated and tortured, so the whole process was botched up. Uh, One of the doctors uh, said that the whole process seems like it's stood on its head. And, uh, like everything should be in reverse. Like they, they, it shouldn't be them that's on trial. It's, it's the government that should be on trial. Again, this is a, a very politicized environment. And in, in the politicization of the environment, you have two very polarized and radicalized positions. So if you listen to the government and to the Sunni constituency of the government, um, the government is too soft uh, on the Shias um, because they fear that these Shias are not really what they're claiming to be, namely advocates of democracy and human rights, but that they're hoping to take over in order to have an Islamic republic that is aligned to Iran. If you go to the Shias, they'll say, no, we, we've been, even though we're a majority in the country, we've been treated as a discriminated against minority, and we need to have democracy and human rights, and maybe we do want an Islamic Republic, but it doesn't mean we'll be subject to Iran. So you've got these totally contradictory, conflictual positions, um, and as a result, you have to- two totally, completely different narratives. In the midst of all this, uh, the U.S. has decided to resume arms sales to Bahrain without uh, seeing your commission's report, without seeing if there's any compliance of your commission's report. And um, it's an interesting move by the U.S. I I imagine it's an an insult to the commission. It's not an insult to the commission. You you have to forgive me for, for saying that I... I wish I could use one of those words which are considered 
uh, an expletive to be deleted. But, you know, U.S. foreign policy seems to abund in these situations in which um, there, there's one faux pas after another, and you don't really know how this comes about. And uh, logic of things would be that if the U.S. strongly supported the commission with the government of Bahrain, as it did, as did you know all of the members of the Security Council and, and the EU and others, that the U.S. would say, well, let's wait to see what the report comes out. Now, yeah, who in the UN, in the U.S. bureaucracy, decided? Well, gee, this is the right time to do it. Yeah, I, I, I see no valid reason why this is done. Um, it, it's not a question of undermining the Commission because, in the final analysis, you know, we have no dog in this fight. You know, we're not trying to take over power, and we're not trying to keep those in power. Um, we're just entrusted with a moral, ethical duty of saying what happened, and what needs to be done to correct it. And we're doing that. But if if the U.S. wants to support the government of Bahrain, it would seem to me that there are better ways of doing it than to announce an arms sales before knowing what the results are, especially at a time when court decisions, that is, military courts, are announcing these draconian sentences on individuals. When the Commission's report comes out, um, what exactly happens then if you're, uh, you know, it sounds like um, one of these medical people would say, uh, you know, the government's guilty of torture. Uh, they tortured me until I confessed, and that's straight-up torture. Um, what do you do for a government that's uh, guilty of something like that? Well, I, I think you you have to look at uh, the overall situation. You you. Basically, uh, this is the way you look at the situation. You, you've had demonstrations in February, which escalated to massive demonstrations in March, to a cutting off of the country in half, to the demonstrators being almost on the verge of changing the regime. It, it was one of those situations, if I can make an analogy, though I realize they're difficult to make. With Egypt, it would be like saying that there was a turning point on a given day where um, the demonstrators had complete control of Tahrir Square and the city were marching on the area where Mubarak's residence and office is, and Mubarak gets a message from the military, listen, we're not going to start firing on the people. You had better get out of here. Um, I think Bahrain was very close to a situation like that, except that in this case, the military in Bahrain did intervene, um, and, and it stopped it. So you didn't have a regime change. Subsequent to that, there were all sorts of actions taken by the government. And the question is, to the government, do you really think what you did was right? And the king answered that question by saying, I don't think it was right. I think we made mistakes. And I am going to look for international experts who are independent who are going to come and tell me what was wrong, how I can correct it for the future. So looking at that, it becomes extremely relevant to say, who did the torture? Was it the military? Was it the, the CIA or secret police? Was it the, the regular police? You know, is, is there a problem of lack of professionalism, lack of training, lack of accountability? So that's one sector. The sector of justice is very important. I mean, why do you have military courts running parallel to civilian courts? You know, um, how do you correct that situation? How do you avoid having anybody who opposes you, uh, uh, you know, risk f finding themselves in front of military courts and getting you know, 10, 15 years in prison only because they transgress the limits of what the government considers uh, acceptable. How do you prevent abuses of power in dismissing people from their jobs or dismissing students from, from, uh, from their academic lives? Um, th th there, were, there were hosts of issues there um, that the government or that part of the government and the king interested in reform should know in order to prevent um, the same from happening in the future. 
How do you take the way the commission's been spun in the press? Because it's gotten it from everybody. Uh, the Bahrain news agency, the government's news agency, has spun you into um, conflict with people. It seems to be getting spun wildly. It is. Um, in a sense, and, and I'm not saying that facetiously, but in a sense, this is a good sign. Um, it's a good sign because... If, if you manage to, to make everybody unhappy at you and, and if all sides uh, have something negative to say about you, then it's, it's uh, to say the least, an attestation uh, that, that you're neutral or at least that, that, that you're not taking sides. Um, but the report, when it will come out, will, will produce the same result, if not more. Because there's no doubt that the government made a lot of mistakes. Um, and, and the report will have to say that. And it will have to make a lot of recommendations for changes. These are going to be bitter pills to swallow for the government. So government supporters are going to say, oh, this is exaggerated, this is not right, and they're going to take issue with, with, with this, that, or the other. The the opposition is going to say, oh, this is too mild. You know, they haven't gone far enough. They they haven't condemned the government enough. They haven't taken this extra step of saying, you know, the government should do this, that, and the other. Um, so I, I'm sure this will be the case. But, but I can tell you in all candor that the, the five of us, you know, have their life history to show their integrity and, and uh, their objectivity and their commitment to to the field of human rights. And, and to me, that's a great sign of comfort. And working with them, uh, and particularly with an extraordinarily dedicated staff of 22 people that we have there working in the field, who, people who are working 14, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, the total abnegation, um, you know, this is, this is a great accomplishment. Sharif Bassioni is chairman of the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry, and he's president emeritus of DePaul University's International Human Rights Law Institute. Thanks a lot for joining us, Sharif, and talking about the commission. Thanks.